Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Vince Molinero, and welcome to this episode of the Lead the Future podcast. I'm very excited to have Ron Carucci with us today. Uh, he's here to speak about his new book, more about that in one sec. But Ron is the co-founder and managing uh, partner at Navalent, and he has a 30-year track record working with CEOs and executives to help them tackle the challenges of strategy, organization, and leadership. Uh, he's worked in over 25 countries on four continents, and he's a sought-after speaker, uh, author of eight books, and a contributor to the Harvard Business Review and Forbes uh, magazines. And his most recent book, To Be Honest, uh, Lead with Power, Truth, Justice, and Purpose, uh, has just been released. In fact, it has recently been awarded the New York City Big, uh, Big Book Award in 2021. So welcome, Ron. Uh, very excited to have you uh, with us and really do appreciate you making time and sharing the insights uh, from your book. Hey, Vince, how are you? Thanks for having me. Great to be with you. No problem. Uh, great to uh, be able to chat with a, another leadership geek <laughs> on topics that are we hold near and dear to our hearts. Uh, so uh, the, the book is a, is a great, uh, you know, great piece of work. I can just imagine the time you spent on it, given how thorough the research is. I'm really curious, though, as you looked at the leadership landscape, what was it that motivated you to write this book? So we didn't start out to write a book on honesty. Um, we have this phenomenal database of research data that we use from the forensic um, diagnostic interviews that we do. We did a 10-year longitudinal study uh, with 2,700 leaders five, six years ago to isolate for individual leadership behavior. And I wanted to know what was in that basket uh, with respect to systems and organizations. So we decided this time, since we use a really cool set of AI technology, to rather than going with a hypothesis to sort of let the intelligent uh, technology be smart and tell us what we should be asking it. So we fed the data all in, 15 years of data, 3,200 interviews, and said, what should we be asking you? And it came back with some really interesting drill sites uh, around the issues of honesty and truth telling and justice. And we thought that was really compelling. And so we thought, okay, let's go drill and see if there's any way that you could actually predict under what conditions people would be honest and tell the truth and behave fairly and serve a greater good and under which conditions they wouldn't. And in fact, it came back with really compelling statistical models that, that tell us we in fact can predict those things. And so that was compelling enough to want to write a book. That's awesome. So um, as you were kind of writing the book and you were getting kind of the insights from the research, how has it evolved and shaped your thinking about what it means to be a leader today? That earning and keeping the trust of those that are important to us is much harder than most leaders understand. We're in a trust recession right now. And honesty is not just a character trait or some moral guidance that we have or don't have. It's actually a muscle. We learned clearly that this is a capability that you have to practice and you have to practice it every day. And those leaders that work hard to earn and keep the trust of their most important stakeholders do very well. But those leaders that rely um, almost exclusively on their good intentions assuming they get extra credit for those, can get themselves into trouble even with the best of intentions. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I've, I've, I've had the same observation and, and I've certainly shared with the leaders we work with that, you know, when it comes to leadership, good intentions are not enough. And, and that's very aligned with, uh, you know, with, with your thinking. I'm curious in terms of as you've been out now, um, you know, as the book has been launched and you've been sharing the ideas with leaders that you work with around the world, what has been, you know, the reactions of those audiences and what's resonated the most? Um, through that uh, what's been really heartening, Vince, is it's striking all the nerves I, I hoped it would. Um, so this is a book of heroes. I did not want to write the villain stories. You know, when we wanted to go out and validate the findings of the research, I wanted exemplars. I wanted to showcase the stories of thought leaders and executives who we'd be proud to emulate, people whose stories are worthy of wanting to tell, and people we'd love to have as our boss. Yeah. Um, and so I think people are getting really energized that they're, you know, the bad apples don't outweigh the, or outshine the good apples. Yeah. Um, I, I think that that honesty is a muscle is really very telling to people that, that it's a lot harder to work at it than people thought. And also, you know, we, we, we used a whole bunch of neuroscience to bear out how 
what are the natural predispositions of us as humans? And that 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 we're pre-wired for honesty was really a pleasant surprise. But that that our brain regions also closely associate truth telling with justice and purpose. Meaning that the definition of honesty that our, our our bodies expect is you have to say the right thing, do the right thing, and say and do the right thing for the right reason, truth, justice, and purpose. And to get awarded the label of honesty, to be deemed as trustworthy, you actually have to do all three. So what? why, you know, because we teach this to kids uh, when they're very, very young, why is it hard for, for leaders to be honest? What, what, what have you found in your work? You know, what I, it was interesting... Vince, I, I don't find most of the deceit out there to be in the service of self-interest. There's certainly those psychopaths out there that are on the take and they get our headlines every day. I didn't want to tell the Toronto stories or the Volkswagen stories or, you know, the the, the Wells Fargo stories. I wanted to tell the, the good stories. But the vast majority of deceit and deception out there is in the service of self-protection. Some some image we want to concoct of ourselves, some response we want to engineer, some uh, reaction we want to avoid, some pain we're trying to uh, engage. Uh, you know, I ask leaders to do this you know, work all the time. If you want to become more honest, you have to become more honest about your dishonesty first. Mm -hmm. University of Massachusetts research says that we all lie on average twice a day. Uh, and if there's even remote truth in that, I ask leaders to simply go back over the last 10 days of your life, look at your calendar, you know, recall where you've been. And if I were to ask you to document all of your moments of dishonesty, all the places where you behave beneath your values, the data you embellished to your boss, the feedback you withheld from your teammate or your direct report, the, the Starbucks barista you were curt with, the family member you ignored, um, the places where you were not, your, your say-do gap was, a, was distinct. You would find an absolute pattern among those behaviors and those experiences, you would you would see that there are certain conditions that bring you to your dishonesty, that bring you to your lesser self. And there's a need you're meeting. There's a narrative that you've told yourself that this behavior um, will meet this need, even though it's not true. And unless you're true about those narratives, you can't rescript them into more honest ones. Yeah. Um, all of us have those patterns. All of us have those conditions that invite a, the, the darker side of us out. And you have to face into that mirror if you want to become more honest. Yeah, so that you know the level of of self awareness and self in, insight that we need is is really extraordinary. You know, and, and I think particularly because uh, you know that self protection is also I think about the complexity of leadership today and the pressures and the demands that many leaders are, uh, face. It's not an easy role, and so we can find ourselves you know slipping into some of these traps. But you know, you, you provide kind of the way forward for us to to be a little bit more enlightened and, and self aware. Now well, there, I, there are, I think most leaders don't appreciate the complexity that you mentioned. I don't, I think yeah. they think, especially when you go from the middle to the top, I think organizations want people to believe that this is just a bigger version of what you've always mm -hmm. been doing. And the whole idea of living your life in a fishbowl or on, on the jumbotron in public, the whole idea of having everything you say and do scrutinized, um, uh, everything being your fault, um, people trying to read your mind and, and, and attribute motives to you that aren't there. Um, it's an assault and leadership can be a very unforgiving role. And most people are just not prepared for that. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, the opportunity we have is to help people, you know, understand that that's in, in our language, in the work I do, that's what you're signing up for. That's part of the contract. And you need to know that before going in, if you hope to be, to be effective. Now, there's a couple of chapters I really want us to hone in on because uh, certainly with those who is kind of our primary audience who view the and view the the podcast and listen to it, um, the two that really jumped out at me um, is um, and you know here here's the book and its cover. And I'm going to start actually with the uh, the chapter on nurturing dignity and accountability uh, because a lot so much of our work uh, that we do is around accountability, but you there's a sentence in there that I'm going to just read if you're okay with it because it's so, uh, uh, accurately captures where we're at with that term because we have this love-hate relationship with the term. We want to drive accountability, and yet it's a loaded term that creates issues. So you say, few words in management vernacular induce a tighter wince than accountability. Uh, love that line. It's so true. Uh, say more. What got you to that point? Well, you, you know, you never, I'm sure none of your clients have ever said to you, oh, Vince, I'm so excited. Today's my performance review. Um, because the process in our organization that ought to be the most 
uh, honoring the most uh, dignifying has become the most demoralizing and demeaning. You, you, our, our accountability processes are so antiquated. They were they were began in a in an era where work was repeatable. That count literally accountability meant an accounting yeah. of your work and nothing more. Um, but our but our work has so drastically evolved from that that no longer is my remit to you the number of files I closed, the number of cases I resolved, the number of T-shirts I printed. Um, today, my remit to you is my analysis, my creativity, my ideas, my solutions, my um, out-of-the-box thinking, my feedback. Um, my remit to you is as personal as I am. My, the contribution and the contributor are much more fused today than ever. So when you talk about my work, you are talking about me. You can't say, it's not personal, I'm just talking about your work. And so leaders don't understand that. You, if you do that in an undignifying, dishonoring way, and you do it in an, um, a disadvantaging way, meaning some people get more privileged accountability than others, or some identities get more privileged than others. In other words, the, the playing field's not level. Um, when there's not justice and dignity in this process, I'm now entitled to take. When I've been wronged, I'm gonna get my pound of flesh. What we now know from, the re from that research, Vince, is that when your accountability processes are not seen as just uh, or dignifying, um, you're four times more likely to have people lie and cheat. Um, but when people feel like their contributions are talked about in an honoring way, when there's a fair shot at success, you're four times more likely to have people behave honestly and, and serve a greater good. Yeah. Yeah. What I love is, you know, I mean, certainly my take is when we get accountability right, it can be inspiring. Um, and yet, you know, it, it, we have this notion of it as being highly negative, as you cite, punitive, blaming, demoralizing, demeaning. And it doesn't have to be that way. Now, what's great in the chapter is you also talk about how do leaders really drive accountability and dignity? You want to speak to that because I know everyone would want to know uh, how to do exactly what you're what you're suggesting. Some very simple things you can do, you know, when you talk to your or um, those you lead about their work in your monthly one on ones or um, don't, don't for goodness sake, don't wait till the end of the year to save it all up. <laughs> um, you know, do you do you struggle to give them constructive feedback? Do you struggle to talk about the places where they're falling short? Because if you do, that's as dishonoring as ignoring their wins. Um, it's never kind to withhold feedback that can help somebody get better. It's cruel. And it's only you indulging your discomfort. It's not helping them at all. You may tell yourself it's grace. Oh, I'll give them I'm having a bad day. Everybody makes mistakes, blah, blah, blah. No, it's cruel. Um, secondly, um, taking, it, taking for granted the goodness that they bring by giving them a cheap, hey, way to go. One of the questions I love to ask audiences that I speak to is how many of you have ever received a compliment from your boss that you found insulting? Uh, and more than half the hands in the room always go up. And when I ask them why, they'll say things like it, it was insincere. They didn't know what I did. They didn't know what they were talking about. They had no idea what it took for me to accomplish what I did. And so now you're wasting an incredible currency by honoring somebody's work by with a cheap, you know, obligatory drive-by praising. Uh, one of the most underused um, sources of honor is asking for the story. When people hand you their work, when the people sort of finish a project or finish something that you've asked them to do, acknowledge, you know, I'm sure I have no idea what it took for you to accomplish that. Tell me, how'd you do it? And listen to the story. Huh. And by honoring the story, by listening to it, watch how animated they become. Watch how much data they give you about them. Watch, listen for the moments where they broke through, where they struggled, where they learned, because they're going to give you a blueprint for how to keep them motivated and engaged. Um, and just taking the five or seven minutes to hear the story in itself is an incredible act of honor that we just so often forfeit because we don't take the time to ask. Yeah, as, as you're chatting, I'm reflecting on, you know, some of the great leaders I've had the opportunity to work with. And in those moments, you know, not only do they kind of honor the story, wh what they also do is they they know things about what I did that I didn't think they knew. <laughs> Uh, because, you know, uh, great employees who are fully committed, you know, unleash their discretionary efforts and are doing things that go above and beyond what's on the job description. Um, and, and when leaders really can tune in on that, provide recognition, you know, pr honor them, as, as you say, it, it's really, really powerful uh, in terms of just securing that, that degree of uh, engagement and passion that someone has. Uh, so great, great, great insights there.
The other thing that you have to do as a leader is to be honest about the injustices around you. There are processes that disadvantage people. If there are privileged roles in your organization, and there are, if you're in a technology firm, I bet your engineers are privileged. If you're in a, a high growth firm, I bet your salespeople are privileged. If you're in a brand driven firm, I bet your marketers are privileged. Which me, And I'm not suggesting that we have to somehow have this false egalitarian sense that all workers created equal. It's not. But all people are. And if those privileges disadvantaged others and people feel like they can't be as successful, now you've unleveled the playing field. If you can't be sure that everybody on your team believes without a doubt that they, no matter who they show up as, no matter what they look like, no matter where they've come from, they have as much of a chance of success as anybody else in your organization, you have to right those wrongs. And when you see injustice, when you see unfairness, when you see a microaggression, when you see somebody treated unfairly, um, for goodness sake, when you do it, yeah. if you're not taking responsibility for that and advocating for justice for people, your silence is consent. You're then condoning the injustice. And until people see you righting that wrong, using your power for greater good, um, your credibility will be um, uh, uh, short lived. Yeah. And I don't know what, what you're what you see in your work, but one of the things that comes up a lot is that, you know, many leaders you know, regardless of the level that, that they happen to be at, sometimes just act as bystanders, right? They, they, they see things happening where they should, you know, be stepping up, should be calling out uh, the, the injustice, should be righting a wrong, and then just maybe because it doesn't affect them personally or it's too much effort, uh, you know, just kind of watch and observe, but, but don't necessarily kind of get involved. And I think that's the other thing that's compelling about your ideas um, is that, you know, in order for the, to make this happen, leaders are going to require courage, um, you know, because <clears throat> righting a wrong, calling out an injustice isn't going to be uh, for the faint of heart. What's, what, what's your take on that? What's been your experience? That's absolutely true, Vince. And if you can't sh shift from being a bystander, telling yourself that it's not your job, to an upstander that actually stands up for goodness, your team won't want to follow you. Um, you, you know, your discomfort is irrelevant. Uh, it's you know, interesting, but the reality is you're, if you're a leader, others are wanting to emulate and follow you. They're wanting to follow your example and your silence yeah. will set an example. Mm -hmm. Here's a simple litmus test. If you don't have somebody coming into your office t once or twice a week saying something to you that makes you uncomfortable, you can be very confident your leadership sucks <laughs> because they're telling somebody. And yeah. if you're not modeling the, modeling the example of what it means to say hard things to people in compassion and love, not like a jerk, um, then you can best assure people aren't going to give you that same regard. Yeah. Um, and they, pe your people need to see you not just fighting for them, but fighting for what's right um, and not tolerating BS, not tolerating nonsense. Um, it doesn't mean you have to be successful with every stance you take. But, but you have to let people know that you share their sense of right and wrong. You share their sense of injustice and you advocate for what's right. And even within the means of what you, you, you may not be able to change the performance appraisal system that sucks, but you don't have to administer it in the same offensive way. Yeah. I have, I mean, I have, one have more client. power and authority that, than, than we probably realize. Sorry. Church. Well, we actually absolutely do have way more power. Our 10 year study, that was the biggest yeah. revelation of that study was that um, the greatest abuse of power is the abandonment of it, the people choosing not to use it at all. Um, but you don't, you don't have to keep, you know, putting salt in the wound. We, I had one client I was coaching um, and we intentionally scheduled one of our sessions right after his performance review. Um, he was a high performing individual. He was slated to be a successor to a very big job in his organization within the next year. And he comes on camera and I could see the veins in his neck just bulging. Um, and he starts off in this irate, you know, she gave me a three. I'm always a four. In my last company, I was a five. I'm always the top rated. But now HR says there's a quota. So I got the three. Who the hell got the four? And I mean, he was just irrational. And I'm, I, I had to sort of take 15 minutes to back him off the ledge. And I asked him to send me the forms because I wanted to read what this woman, what she'd written about him. And I'm reading through you know, the pages. I'm thinking, wow, this is really fair. She's been very kind. She's been very affirming. She's clearly still, he's still beloved. He's still on track to get this big job. But it was the categorical thinking, the number that triggered him. And turns out our brains, our amygdala goes into hijack when we're categorized. When we feel labeled or put in a box, we feel invisible and we feel unsafe. 
So be aware that the labels you put on people, even good ones, right. um, will trigger people. Um, and you don't have to do that. You don't have to play by those rules. You can make sure people don't ever walk away from any interaction with you feeling anything but clear and honored. Yeah. And that's if that's true. not how they're walking away, um, find out why. Yeah. So let, let's um, let's keep the conversation going because where I want to switch next is another part. You know, we, we talked a lot about how leaders need to step up, how they lead their people, how they how they kind of really drive accountability and dignity. The other part I found really fascinating because it is a world that uh, leaders struggle with. And, and, and it's really in this chapter on the need for leaders uh, to be stitching organizational seams. Um, and, and sort of give me a sense of where did that come from and, and what, what are you seeing uh, relative to those ideas? You know, Vince, we, all of our organizations have silos to some degree. We all have fragmentation. It's a natural byproduct of scale. We, you know, things pull apart. Um, but what we found is that uh, those silos are more than just an organizational uh, annoyance. Um, this is probably the biggest surprise in the findings. When those seams, you know, sales and marketing, supply chain operations, uh, R&D and uh, innovation, when those intersections where true competitive value is mostly created, when there's nothing but rivalry there, um, you are six times more likely to have people be dishonest. Because once you fragment the organization, you now fragment the truth. And so when you have dueling truths, my goal is no longer a single source of truth. My, my goal is very simple to show you that I'm right and you're wrong. But when those teams are stitched well, when there's a context for that conflict to be held well and resolved, when there's a greater, a bigger story we both feel part of, when there's a we instead of a we and a they, now you're six times more likely to have people be honest and tell the truth because now I feel part of a bigger story. Now I understand how one plus one equals three, but most organizations allow those seams to remain um, unstitched and uh, and siloed, and and there's a huge risk in doing that. Yeah, yeah, and, and what I find that while you know we, we've got to find a way to structure ourselves, right? Uh, but but a lot, and I don't know if you see this, but what we find is a lot of times the silos are just ingrained in our brains, uh, and it prevents people from acting in ways that really is aligned with the ideas in that chapter around reaching out and either, you know, stitching the seams where, where they're frayed, uh, where they're coming apart, or where they're just not even connected by any means. Uh, because like you, I, I completely agree. The 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 opportunity that's lost, the money left on the table. The, how it erodes um, uh, execution and driving results is is really not fully appreciated. Uh, certainly, coming in outside as an external, you see it, but a lot of times they don't. And, and I'm sure you see that with your own uh, clients that you serve. You know, I think I mean human beings are naturally tribalistic. That's just how we're wired, and we define the tribe as whatever the affinity is. And our, if our, the smaller the affinity, the more rivals we have. And of course, you know, tribes can be at war with each other. They can also cooperate. We, you know, as humans, we're the only species that can actually cooperate with other tribes. Um, what we have to learn to do is expand the definition of our we. Um, and so what, what I ask my clients all the time is, who's your they? Who's the person that shows up in your caller ID and when they do, you roll your eyes and they go, gosh, what do they want? Well, you see them coming down the hall and you get tense. Um, the other question you have to answer is, who's they are you? Because there's somebody that finds you to be the biggest pain in their neck uh, of their day. What are you doing to make their life miserable that you don't even know you're doing? Get on the phone with one of your days, you know, arrange for a coffee or a lunch and just simply say, our people are watching us. We're making their lives hell because we haven't figured out how to get along better. We can do better. What can I do to be a better colleague to you? How can I make your life less stressful? And just build a bridge. That's what great leaders do. They create breadth. They see the organization as a whole, not as greater than the sum of its parts, not just their own part. Yeah, and what I really loved uh, in there was when you're reaching out is having a conversation of what is the shared value we need to create together? Um, you know, because then you just, you make it about the business, the company, the organization, and who you're there to serve. Um, and and that's, a, that, that's a powerful conversation to have with a colleague where the relationship may not exist, may be strained, or just as absent because you haven't paid attention to it. Most of us to start with the assumption that my, mine is the important function, I'm the center of the universe, and whatever you do is superfluous to that. No competitive asset in an organization exists within any one single set of walls. Innovation 
you know, as a competitive differentiator is the, is the byproduct of customer analytics and R and D and marketing. Um, you know, uh, customer service is the intersection of supply chain logistics and, and service, um, you know, sa sales or, or high growth or high impact customer impact is the combination of growth, financial analytics and, and, and market intelligence. It's the com combination of these, of these functional assets that create a true organizational capability. And you have to see yourself as part of a bigger story. And you have to just start with the conclusion that uh, apart from those things, I'm useless. And it's only in combination of those things that I can really create great value and lasting value. I ought to figure out how to make sure I'm doing that. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is uh, an opportunity for leaders deeper in the organization that I think they sometimes don't don't fully appreciate. Because certainly, uh, I've worked with enough CEOs. I'm sure you have as well, where they look in and they see the fragmentation. Uh, they, they see the the seams fraying apart. And I can't tell you how many times a CEO would say can't we just operate like one company? And making that happen, uh, unfortunately, is, is much harder. And, and the insights you share, I think, really help leaders, uh, as you say, build those bridges that are so critical to, um, you know, executing on the strategy. One of the, one of the, and, one, and so what those CEOs do that's horrible is they declare one Acme, one Jones. They just sort of put the word one in front of the company, the company name and, and, and start a campaign yeah. um, as if that were going to do something. Um, and what, what's so striking to me is you're absolutely right. As you get to the top of an organization, you're, you're forced to, to, to take a higher altitude view and see the pieces as part of a whole. You just don't understand that it's your job to stitch the seams. It's your right. job to expect them to be stitched. And I, you know, I tell my clients all the time, your organization is perfectly designed to get the results you're getting. Yeah. So if you're getting border wars, it means you're designed for those border wars. If you don't want border wars, design it to get something else. Yeah. But simply declaring that you'd like it to be different is interesting, but useless. Yeah. So don't, don't sit there idly by thinking, I wish they would all just get, why can't we all just get along? Is, is a severe abdication of your role and basically go, sending you home every day saying, there's no reason for you to exist here. You know, right. the, the company would have been better off had you not come to work today. But you, you, if you want your presence to be value creating, then for goodness sake, when you see that challenge, get in there and, and figure out how to make it better. So as we begin to kind of wrap up, I'm really curious if there were kind of one takeaway that you want, you know, the audience um, watching or listening to this podcast come away with, what would that be for you in light of um, the insights in your book? To remember that honesty is a muscle that you have to, you know, you don't go to the gym and bench press 200 pounds on the first day. Don't assume that you're ready for that test, that when that dilemma comes your way, when that ethical trade-off comes your way, when the moment of truth uh, has you on the jumbotron, you know, facing a, a difficult situation, that you're ready to bench press that degree of um, uh, of moral conduct. Um, if your moral center is not prepared for that, don't assume you will be when it comes. You have to practice every day. Uh, you have to work at this. So start simply. You know. Um, Pull the values off the wall. Pull your brand promise or your purpose statement off the wall. Bring it into your next team meeting and say, hey, how are we doing against this? How am I doing? Am I, do, do you, are you able to see me as a role model of these things or, or do, you, uh, uh, do you have to work in spite of me? If somebody followed our team around with a video camera all day long, could that video be used as a training program to train people on these values? Or would people roll their eyes? Start somewhere. Pick your day. Figure out who's the one that you know you have. Uh, reach out and start a conversation. There's There are practical ways to begin the journey, but for goodness sake, don't wait till you're tested. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So um, one more final question, uh, but before doing that, if uh, folks wanna reach out, what's the best way that they can connect with you to find out how you might be able to go in and speak or potentially support them? Uh, in, in some work that you do with your firm. Yeah, so please stay in touch. Come to visit us at Navalent, N-A-V-A-L-E-N-T dot com. Uh, we have a treasure trove of eBooks, white papers, blogs, videos. You can download there. If you, if you want to learn more about the book, um, uh, the research behind it, there's a webinar. We also did a TV series. So if you want to meet, the, I, there was no way I could use all the information that these heroes gave me. So we did a TV series, uh, 15 episodes called Moments of Truth. Uh, where you can see all the behind the scenes stories of, of inspiration from these from these leaders I spoke with. And you can find all of that at tobehonest.net. 
and the TV series was called Moments of Truth. So look for all those episodes. It's a great binge watch for the weekend. Awesome. So please, great. please follow me and follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter. Great. Uh, so last question. Um, uh, we ask every podcast guest uh, to provide their perspective, words of wisdom or advice, leadership advice to young people. Uh, certainly those just entering the workforce. It's been a tough couple of years for many of them. Now, hopefully, as things have, are, are, are getting back to um, more, more openness, less restrictions, they can get their career started, or they may have been in the workplace for the last three to four years. Maybe they're just starting their first people leadership role. What, it, what, what, what words of wisdom would you share for young leaders? You know, you've got to um, see your career as a long game. You've got to understand that these next years are a part of a much bigger story. Don't look for perfection in the first couple of years. You have to, certainly, you're all voting with your feet. You're telling us that you're not going to tolerate the crap by 69 million folks just quit in the last six months. So I appreciate that your, your standards are very high. And I don't want you to compromise those. But at the same time, try and stay and make it better. Don't believe your voice doesn't matter. Your, your ideas, your voice, your convictions, they matter. But if you're not there to help make it better, it'll never get better. So don't give up too quickly on an imperfect workplace. Um, do what you can to raise your concerns and, and raise your voice to a place where it can be heard. In a way, it can be heard. And then at some point, if it's time to make a change, it is. But don't give up too easily. Awesome. Thank you uh, so much, Ron. Great, great uh, words of wisdom. Uh, really uh, uh, respect and admire the work that you're doing. I wish you and your teams uh, continued success. And uh, of course, uh, wish you all the best with your new book. And thanks again for your generosity of time to join us today on the Lead the Future podcast. Thanks so much, Ron. A pleasure, Vince. Thanks for having me.